Welcome to Cambridge Forum. Tonight we'll be discussing reimagining equality with Anita Hill, professor of social policy, law, and women's studies at Brandeis University. I'm Trisha Rose, Brown University professor, and I will be your moderator. In her new and amazing memoir, Reimagining Equality, Stories of Gender, Race, and Finding Home, Anita Hill takes the idea of home and explores how our family homes and our national home are linked to understandings of achievement, opportunity, and equality. Hill takes us on a journey that begins with her own family story and ends with the current mortgage meltdown. Along the way, we visit homes across America and meet some extraordinary African-American women from playwright Lorraine Hansberry to Baltimore hairdresser Anjanette Booker. How have these women experienced home in America? How successful have the movements for racial and gender equality been in eliminating barriers to opportunity? And how is the current economic crisis affecting America's commitment to equality? What challenges does Anita Hill see ahead? The youngest of 13 children, Anita Hill grew up on a farm in rural Oklahoma. After receiving her JD from Yale University in 1980, she worked in private practice and for the federal government in Washington, DC. Hill is the author of numerous professional articles on international commerce, commercial law, bankruptcy, and civil rights. Her book, Speaking Truth to Power, detailed her experience as a witness in Clarence Thomas's Supreme Court confirmation hearings. Her latest book, Reimagining Equality, is the basis for our present discussion. Please join me in welcoming to the Cambridge Forum, Anita Hill. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Good evening, and um, I cannot say thank you enough. I am just so thrilled to be here. Uh, thank you, Professor Rose, for that gracious introduction. Thank all of you for coming out tonight in, in this lovely weather. Uh, gosh, where do I start saying thank you? I could say it all night here. I want to. I have some friends here, of course. I have to start with Beacon Press, uh, but. I will also end with saying thank you to my Brandeis colleagues for coming out tonight to uh, support me and to hear me talk about this work that I have been mumbling uh, about for the past oh, two or three years and really working hard to try to get together. Um, as uh, Professor Rose mentioned to you, I'm starting out this work with the story of my family and my ancestral family. And um, I, in, in a few chapters, seven chapters, bring us to some modern day issues and conflicts in what I call a crisis of home. Uh, this is uh, the launch day for the book. And so this is the first time I've given this talk. And, uh, and I'm, I'm, I guess I'm a little anxious about it uh, because this product is really something, reimagining equality is something that is very near to me. It is part memoir, but it is not entirely memoir. Uh, it shares with you not only my family story, but the stories of a number of women, past and present, and it attempts to bring us into a future conversation uh, that will, I hope, impact generations to come. And so I'll begin. We are often referred to, or we've referred to the United States as a nation of immigrants. So what does that mean? What it means to me is that as such, as a nation of immigrants, we are a population of seekers and descendants of seekers, people in search of home. For decades in our early history, we measured American progress in terms of movement and expansion. 
And even today, we gauge advancement toward the American dream by one's ability to seek out and secure a new, often bigger, and presumably better home in a different location from where they are now. Growing up in a stable community in rural Oklahoma uh, with my 12 siblings on a farm, I felt not so much like a seeker as a settler. I felt very settled in rural Oklahoma. And I even felt cheated out of ancestral participation in the pivotal movement toward progress uh, that so many African Americans experience, known as the Great Migration. It was known for me as the Great Migration in part, not just because there are a lot of people moving from, north, from south to north to west, but because of the great anticipation and the great expectations that came out of the movement. However, in researching reimagining equality, I learned that my family story involved movement as well. In doing so, and doing the research and understanding my own relationship with home, as well as my history, I came to appreciate not only the role that movement played, but also the role that those years of being settled on the farm in Oklahoma played in terms of the achievement of equality for me and my 12 siblings. Now, for those of you who are interested in research, and um, I hope uh, some of you are uh, uh, doing your family history. And I'm sure every one of you has an old, uh, a family story to tell about home. I'll just say that I began the story, of the chronicling of my family story, with a family legend. That was the start. And as many of people will see, you know, when you're a, a uh, academic, family legends are not necessarily be, to be sort of taken on their face. You have to have hard documentation to go along with them. And so as I was filling out the family legends and stories, I did interviews uh, with family members I um, had conversations and read historians' work. I searched through historic documents from a variety of sources. And for those of you, um, I'll say, well, younger than I am, that's a lot of you, um, I use new technology. So let's start with the family legend, which is where I began. Family legend had it that my grandparents left Arkansas and left behind a large working farm. And so the first question I asked myself to question where, how we got from Arkansas to Oklahoma and to understand the movement of my family was how did my grandparents get a large farm in Arkansas? Uh, my grandfather, in fact, Henry Elliott, William Henry Elliott was born in 1864. So he was born a slave. And I wanted to know how this child who was born a slave could ultimately come upon owning a large farm in Arkansas, uh, given the times uh, that he grew up in. Um, but what I found when I researched the historical records was that, in fact, there were 80 acres that William Henry Elliott and my grandmother, Ida Crooks Elliott, homesteaded in 1895. And to, through the Bureau of Land Management, I was able to find the documentation of this homesteading. So indeed, the legend had truth to it. Um, although in looking at this documentation, I will tell you that I was thrilled to discover this documentation. It was, I never knew my grandparents. And to find this documentation of their lives and their existence, 
uh, to me in a government record was so compelling. Uh, I felt as though I was probably looking at a document that had been tucked away since 1895 that no one had ever paid attention to. And for me, it was like discovery, a discovery of part of my past. Uh, I will say this that I also discovered about that documentation. The deed itself had a number of entries, had quite a bit of information, I'll share some of it with you. But nowhere in that documentation was my grandmother's name mentioned. She was not on the deed. Uh, Ida Crooks Elliott's name did not appear on the deed. The only way that she was referred to was in an applicant question. Uh, it was, is the applicant married? And the answer was yes. Um, there was also a referral uh, that stood in, uh, the information in the document that said that uh, the Elliots, Henry, took possession of the property in 1895, and a month later he had built on the property a two-room cabin where he, his unnamed wife, my grandmother, Ida Crooks Elliott, lived with their seven children. Now, it does seem a little cramped, but indeed it was, I am sure, better than the slave cabin in which he spent the first 10 years of his life. Acre by acre, the Elliots plowed and planted and cleared the land, which was covered with oak and pine trees. And five years, within the five years of the homesteading period, they had tilled and farmed one quarter of the entire parcel. They planted an orchard, and as one observer noted, a fine orchard, one of the finest that he'd ever seen, with fruit trees, and Ida Crooks Elliott filled the yard with flowers. And so this was the farm that Henry Elliott owned, that he and Ida Crooks Elliott occupied. And this was the farm that allowed my grandfather, Henry, to go from being property to owning property in about 50 years. Now, where does the technology come in? I said I use technology. Through Google Earth, I was able to get a bird's eye view of the property. And I looked at it, and today it is once again overgrown with the oak and pine that was there when my grandparents found it. Um, the trees hide its past, its past farm, and even perhaps the past pain that my grandparents experienced there. So how did the family end up leaving this farm? It seems like a, a really quite an idyllic situation. And in fact, perhaps it was in so many ways, it was such a great achievement that even generations later, my family members talk about it with great pride. But there is the other side of the story. And that is the legend that said that Henry Elliott left Arkansas with his family after he was threatened with a lynching. And I heard this story through uh, the eyes of my Uncle George, uh, my mother's brother who was born in 1909. He was one of my primary sources. And he really, it was, it was interesting because he was uh, in his 80s when he told me the story, but he tells me the story of his family's journey to Oklahoma through the eyes of a child. He said, the day they got on the train, he was just so excited about being able to ride a train. This was the first time that he'd ever been on a train. But he also said the day that they left their farm was the first time he'd ever seen his father cry. Nevertheless, they did leave. Um, and they left 
because as a family legend has it, there was a lynching threat. Now, was this likely? Well, how was I to really document the threat? I couldn't be there, but what I could document was the atmosphere of racial violence that existed in Little River County, Arkansas, when uh, my grandparents lived there. And I was able to do that through historians, one of whom, Richard Buckaloo, actually did a chronicling of the number of lynchings and the names of the lynch victims in Arkansas, county by county, year by year. And there were quite a few in the area in which my grandparents lived. So the story of the lynching threat is likely, given the fact that it has endured all of these years, given the fact that my uncle saw my grandfather cry when he had to leave. I put all of those things together and say, I can't say with absolute certainty that this happened, but I can tell you that there's a great likelihood of it. But I also discovered some other factors that shaped Henry and Ida, Elli Ida Elliot's ability to keep the home that they had obtained by right of law, to keep the home that they had shaped to make their own. I discovered one-sided debt agreements that my uh, grandfather, Henry Elliott, had signed with former slave holder, holders, uh, debt agreements that were there simply so that he could raise uh, the crop to stay on the farm. These agreements actually are written and, and uh, in the records in Little River County. And, and if you read them, it's amazing, they were so one-sided that mortgage holders actually had the right to decide and determine what the interest rate on the loans would be. I also learned that there was the, uh, the uh, crop prices during the early 1900s were spiraling down particularly in cotton, which my grandfather grew. Um, I learned of the hardship that my grandparents experienced as three of their 14 children died before they reached the age of eight years old. Indeed, as I say, a number of factors shaped their ability to make a home in Little River County. Violence and official indifference to it, or even worse, suborning of it, unavailability of credit, or any kind of resources, financial resources, to help them earn a living. A failing agricultural economy and no other alternatives for uneducated farmers, particularly if they were black and female. So ultimately, Henry and Ida Elliott lost their home, and I leave to the reader to decide exactly how all of these factors came into play. But what they did was what Americans do. They moved. For the Elliots, they moved west to Oklahoma to search for a better life, if not for themselves, for their children, and soon to be born grandchildren. As I pieced together my grandparents' story, it sounded very eerily similar to some of the stories I read about today. The lack of credit, or bad credit, if you will. The loss of economic resources. The loss of homes. The heartbreak that I read in stories, in papers, in the newspapers today, in 2008, and you know, throughout the last few years, really remind me so much of what took place in the early part of the 20th century. And as well, there are racial elements to the stories that are printed today. As we learn about the devastation in communities of color, uh, the losses that African Americans, Asian Americans, and Hispanic Americans are suffering at the end of this recession. As many, or as much as 65% of the equity, and, and um, excuse me, 65% of the wealth in, among 
Asian Americans and African Americans and Hispanic Americans has been lost in the last few years. And much of that has been tied to loss in the values of their homes. In reimagining equality, I explore the link between credit practices and failing in the failing economies of my grandparents' time. I take you through the era of outright and hostile segregation, through an era of redlining, and throughout of which women were consigned to secondary roles inside and outside the home. I look at restricted covenants and the role they played in shaping communities, and even today, how they echo and shadow over communities in urban areas. And I bring you to today, reverse redlining and targeting of women and people of color for subprime and high fee loans that occurred in the height of the subprime lending debacle. In doing so, I explore a number of ways that we learn about equality and think about equality. I look at law. I look at popular culture. Uh, one of the things that I look at, and, 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 when, and sometimes people really uh, can relate to this story, when I talk about how the role that uh, the home has played in our thinking about um, what achievement is and when people have finally made it, remember the sitcom The Jeffersons? How, how many of you remember the theme song to The Jeffersons? Ah, how could you forget it? So moving up to the east side, to a deluxe apartment in the sky. Now that showed that you had made it. The Jeff George Jefferson and Louise Jefferson, this African-American couple, had made it. And what did they do? Move up. And not only did they move up, but they didn't have to have beans burning on the grill anymore or fish frying. They had bought into a new way of life because they were now able to relocate and prove to the world that they had made it. So I look at popular culture and I look at literature to help really illustrate not only the role that it plays, but, but that, that the home plays in our thinking about equality, but also our shared desire, the desire that we all have to find a home, whether it's we think of it as that place or a state of being. And one play that I think really is pivotal, at least in my growing up and understanding of the significance of home and the relationship that it played in the role of equality is Lorraine Hansberry's A Raisin in the Sun. And I discuss uh, the play because it is such, in many ways, a timeless play. It's been staged and restaged since it debuted, I think, in 1959. Uh, countless times, I think it, in, um, it, it had had an anniversary maybe um, uh, two or three years ago, and across the country there were 200 different stagings of A Raisin in the Sun. And for those of you who don't know it, briefly I will just say that it is a story of an African-American family who have come on to money. They have been living in cramped quarters in a tenement uh, apartment in Chicago, and they the mother, who lives in the apartment with her two adult children and a daughter-in-law and a grandson, wants to use that money to buy a home in the suburb. And she decides she's going to make, buy a home in the suburb of Chicago. Well, the suburb is a segregated suburb. And she beats with resistance in her effort to buy this home. And, um, and of course, in the end of Hansberry's play, we have a somewhat happy, if not uh, cautious, uh, conclusion where ultimately the family moves into the suburb and the neighborhood is integrated. But I think 
even though the white neighbor's resistance is prominent in the play, the play is illuminating in a number of ways. It's illuminating not only about the desires of African Americans, but the desires of all Americans. And so in Reimagining Equality, I write, a raisin in the sun illustrates not only how home became a repository for black Americans' dream of finding a place in the nation, but also how it symbolizes all Americans' desires, desire to belong. It is a story of race and gender and a universal experience of believing in a dream. Hansberry's is a cautionary tale revealing that a dream deferred doesn't just dry up like a raisin in the sun, but as Langston Hughes' poem suggests, instead could just explode. Moreover, the consequences of deferred dreams are not always immediate. They can extend decades into the future with consequences for generations to come. For over 50 years, Lorraine Hansberry's audience have focused on African-Americans' clashes with the world outside their home. Her ability to see into the future of conflicts inside the home is just as compelling. Hansberry advises us of the relationship between the problems outside and those conflicts inside. In the years since her play, I have come to fully appreciate how the two work together to enhance or to impede our chances at real equality. And so I look at Hansberry's play and I see not only the tension that she is raising, the tension between African Americans and white Americans, but also it foretells of the tension between men, women and men and how equality will be defined. What she signals is that that clash, unless we can resolve that clash within the home, unless we can resolve issues of gender equality, we will never be able to fully resolve the issues of racial equality. And so we moved forward beyond the clashes that Hansberry outlines. We moved to, through the 60s. We, came, we saw people of color, women of all colors, make strides in the 1970s and the 1980s. Yet we also saw rising materialism, increased violence in, civil, in, in uh, inner cities, resistance to civil rights gains, and cultural backlash against women. We saw the suburbs were expanding. And we also saw that the blueprint for the average American home was growing as well. Inside the home, changes were occurring as women of all races became part of the paid labor force. And so there were a mixture of factors, some gains and some losses. And there were also laws and policies that were, some were enforced and some were neglected. And if I could fast forward what I would simply say is that all of those things came together to create almost the formula, I'll call it, for the subprime lending crisis. And in Reimagining Equality, I take you through to show how all of those factors contributed to where we are now. But equality, even though it was beginning to be realized, in many respects, the housing crisis came along and hit us hard. It hit communities of color, so much so that cities like Baltimore, Maryland, Memphis, Tennessee, the state of Illinois are suing Wells Fargo Bank for the devastation 
uh, they allege that bank uh, visited upon communities throughout their location. It was no accident that the foreclosure crisis occurred. Indeed, I suggest Hansbury forecasted the factors leading up to it, even though she didn't, of course, forecast the foreclosure crisis, none of us could have. So in reimagining equality, I do draw upon Hansbury's wisdom and her vision. And I look at the lives of contemporary African-American women who are like the millions of Americans who are uncertain about their place, their home, for themselves, and for their children. I look at their desires as universal desires, but I also look at them because their race and gender make their struggles unique. They are not simply looking for ownership. They are looking for a semblance of equality and authority, and that is being threatened by the foreclosure crisis and the housing market collapse. And I hope I'll share some of those stories with you as we go into our discussion. But I also want to say that I don't just leave you with the stories. I do tell you how it happened, and I offer ideas from, for how we, one, can prevent it happening again, and two, how we can make sure that what is happening now does not set back generations to come. And so I propose a number of ideas for how in the wake of the foreclosure crisis, we can overcome the ravages of neglect and deliberate abusive practices. We can assure that the dream of finding home continues for these women and for their children and all of the children in America. And so I will close with a little bit of my vision for what that uh, America will be and what the dream ought to be in the future. Now, since the first African American in our history now occupies the White House, or, or calls the White House his home, it is fitting that I will begin with Barack Obama in terms of this vision. Barack Obama, whose fervent search for home brought him to the presidency, must seize the moment of crisis to enlarge our concept of home for all Americans, but especially for the next generation. I would call, though, upon all leaders, all the nation's leaders, political and social, I would call upon all of you as well to take up this cause. Americans are in need of a 21st century vision of our country. Not a vision of movement, but one of place. Not one of tolerance, but one of belonging. Not simply of rights, but also of community. A community of equals. This new vision will lead to an inclusive American democracy that stays alive and remains real for everyone. And if you'll allow me one indulgence, a personal indulgence, I started talking this talk with a talk about my mother's family. And much of this book is inspired by my mother. And on October 16, 2011, I will celebrate the 100th birthday of my mother, Irma Hill. Now, she is not alive to celebrate with me. <laughs> Nevertheless, I will celebrate. The place where I live with its long snowy winters, that would be here, <laughs> is not likely what she contemplated 35 years ago when she sent me off with two sets of luggage. And I tell that story in the book. But it is my home. And each day I honor her by working to live up to her dream that I will find a more just America than the one she grew up in, and that as she did, 
I will leave that America better than how I found it. Thank you. Thank you. You are listening to Cambridge Forum as we continue our discussion of making a home in America, finding opportunity and achievement, and overcoming the racial, gender, and economic barriers of our society with Anita Hill. So I want to open us up here to sort of think a little bit through what um, Professor Hill couldn't get to. It's, it's a, a marvelous book. And um, the first thing I wanted to give you an opportunity to talk more specifically about is, is how and why you settled on the very interesting hybrid format that you settled on. As the listeners can tell, there's personal storytelling, there's individual storytelling about African American women throughout the 20th century, but there's also in-depth historical, social, contextual policy analysis, and the connections are made between them. I mean, it's, it's a very rich format. It's clearly quite intentional. Can you speak a little bit to what you had in mind? Well, I wanted to, in writing the book, I wanted to start with how people really learn and think, how they learn about inequality and how they, you know, we learn about inequalities or we learn inequality uh, through a number of, uh, of uh, devices. We learn through history. We learn through laws. How we think about equality is sometimes shaped by how we feel about the law, how we think about rights. But we also learn uh, about equality through pop culture and literature. Hansberry's Raisin in the Sun really was a story about what are the end game results of, of an integrated society, of a quest for equality, a dream. Uh, we learn about it through pop culture, like the Jeffersons. Uh, we learn about inequalities through pop culture uh, that, uh, that, uh, that depict women in unfavorable ways. And so I wanted to really reach the reader where how, and how they learn about these topics. Uh, but I also wanted to offer more than simply storytelling. For me, it's important for us to link this behavior in our own understanding to the policies and laws that are in place. And so that's why I, I wanted to come to the readers with a different way of thinking about all of those devices that they have heard throughout their lives. Yeah, no, it, it, it works really very well. Um, on page 112, yes, I'm an academic. We, they, we take <laughs> page notes. I have to look at I'm page sorry. 112. <laughs> you don't. I'll quote you. Okay. I'll quote you. you right now. It's okay. <laughs> you say, the persistent devaluation of those things black and those things female undermines our communities and our country, culturally and economically. And I was struck throughout the book by this desire to make real and personal and um, um, emotionally connecting the stories of individual black women of a variety of class positions. And I, I wanted, if you could, speak to how you think we can move from, as you said, tolerance to real belonging across race and gender. Because it strikes me that this notion of home is about how we can share this space in, in more meaningful, connected ways. Well. Uh, the word empathy, we've heard it, we've heard it bandied about uh, politically, particularly when it comes to the Supreme Court nominations. Uh, but it, the, it, it really is, uh, in some ways, it's about empathy, but it's really about more. It's about not only understanding how these individuals feel, but also how what they feel and what happens to them relates to us. When we say, okay, look, uh, African American communities in Baltimore are devastated, and we try to isolate that, mm. uh, you know, we're not only not, you know, we feel bad for people, we're showing empathy, but that's not enough. What we have to understand is that the devastation of those communities hurts all of us. Uh, I talk about, in one of the stories, the story of Marla, about the crime in her neighborhood. 
street crime that ultimately resulted in her son's death. And we like to think, okay, well, if we just stay out of those neighborhoods, then we will be fine. But in fact, we are not fine. We pay for those crimes ourselves. So in addition to empathy that I want you to get from these stories, I also want you to understand our connectedness and that the fates of individuals that we don't know and you know, may not even read about in the newspaper really matter in our lives. The state entire, there's a reason that the state of Illinois is suing Wells Fargo because, and that is simply put, because the Attorney General of Illinois knew that this was not an isolated neighborhood problem, that these were issues that impacted the entire country. The subprime lending debacle may have started in certain communities, but I dare any of you to find, to, 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 to say that you don't know someone personally who has been affected by it. That you don't have a neighbor or a friend or a son or a daughter who will feel the impact of this crisis that really was just, uh, just started out as African Americans, women, Latinos were targeted for toxic loans. And so that's really what I want us to do. I want us to feel empathy, but I also want us to understand how we're all connected in these issues. And as you know, uh, because of the crisis, an entire financial, global financial system was brought to its knees. So we can't simply look at these things as isolated, unrelated matters. They matter to all of us. And, and I was profoundly struck by the degree to which this is a gendered crisis, that women were not only specifically targeted, but single mothers of all racial backgrounds, but, but substantially black and brown because of the economic circumstances, and that there's been very little discussion of the gendered dimension of this and how much the expectation was that this would be solved by some sort of two two-parent household in a traditional way. I'm wondering if you can speak to that for the audience because it's, it's an extremely compelling theme in the book. Well, you, first of all, that idea of the two-parent family, um, nuclear family, is changing for everyone. That uh, the, the, the rates among uh, adults who have never been married have cre increased uh, over the last 50 years, and they seem to be continually increasing. So that idea that we're all going to be in these two fam two parent family settings uh, is just no longer the norm necessarily anymore. So why do we have policies and why do we have our thinking focused on the world is and problems are going to be resolved if that happens when that does not seem to be the, th the way things are happening today? So that's one thing we need to start to shift what our policy direction will be. But the other thing is this. Uh, it was almost always a perfect storm. It was, as the, what happened was that women on their own were gaining uh, greater economic footing. And in addition to their economic gains, there were social gains. So that more women on their own were buying homes. The statistics were in about uh, 2000, uh, five in 2006, that one in every six of the new home buyers were single women buying homes on their own. Mm -hmm. And not coincidentally, that was the era in which subprime lending escalated. And so it just created like the perfectly bad storm uh, for uh, an impact. Uh, on, on those women, not only their social gains, but their economic gains. And that is a story that is not often told. Um, it will have, I believe, as profound impact as the devastation of communities of color. Our individual wealth as single women has been set back. And the social gains, the ideas that we can make it on our own has been set back. And that really is dangerous for us. 
So I'm going to ask one more question now and then uh, invite, invite questions from the audience. But I, I wanted to return to where you closed briefly, um, to this question about um, Obama as a, uh, a leader on these issues as well as a symbolic leader on these issues. But in particular, I'm, I'm struck by, I mean, I couldn't agree with you more. It would be fabulous if he were to take up your vision and perhaps quote your own book at some point. That would be nice. That would be nice. Uh, that it? would be nice. <laughs> I'm sure Beacon would like that too. <laughs> um, but, but I guess I, I want to sort of um, be uh, hopeful but uh, with, with some uh, caution, which is mm -hmm. to say that I'm struck by how little addressing the reality of structural inequality when it speaks to class, when it speaks to race, when it speaks to gender, how little can be said about that in the public sphere. And that the moment you say it, it's as if the conversation comes to a grinding halt. There's enormous anxiety. Now, certainly, you know, the right wing is an easy scapegoat there, but I'd make the argument that there's a liberal middle that's highly uncomfortable with that kind of language. Mm -hmm. and, and so I'm wondering, how could Obama, even if he had the goal, which we don't know, but assuming he had the goal to take this up, this kind of vision of home and belonging, to move from tolerance to, to buy-in, to move from empathy to, so, to structural change. You know, how possible is that in this climate? And, and in what ways can you imagine us creating a climate that would, in a sense, house your vision more, more fully? Professor Rose makes a very compelling case, doesn't you? And were I not an optimist, I might just pack up and go home. But I am really a, a, a person who believes in change. Um, and if you look at what has happened, if I think about what's happened in my family life in the last 100 years, if I think about what has happened in my lifetime as the uh, beneficiary of Brown versus Board Education, as a beneficiary of so many laws, and, and efforts to achieve gender equality, I have to be optimistic. Now, I understand that it is difficult uh, for President Obama to raise this issue, but this is really, to me, a question about whether or not we can continue to believe in the American dream. That's what this is about. That's what this book is about or whether we are going to continue to price people out of the American dream by putting it on the market and saying that the only way that you can achieve it is to buy a bigger house uh, than your parents had and certainly than your grandparents had. Mm -hmm. If that link between the American dream and the bigger home is one that I hope to disrupt. What I would see as the American dream really is the ability for everyone, regardless of where one lives, to have access to all of the opportunities that this country has to offer. That, for me, is the American dream. And it should not be determined by where we live. We don't give enough thought and have enough conversation about how where one lives determines whether one, where one goes to school, and in many cases the quality of that education, how one is represented in Congress, and more basically whether one is going to have access to basic needs like food, transportation to a job that will pay a living wage. Um, and so those are the things that I think we need to begin to talk about. I hope Pre President Obama can lead that talk, and in, the, in Reimagining Equality, I tell him how I think it can be done. <laughs> but if he can't, if the political times are too tight and too tough for him to lead that, then we have to lead that conversation. And we can do it. And, and if I would just get personal a little bit, I said I wasn't necessarily going to go back there, but I believe that in 1991, personal conversations, public outcry, public engagement led to change for women in the workplace. It happened because, not because our leaders stepped up and said, 
oh, we must do something about sexual harassment. It happened because we raised our voices. And we raised them in quiet ways in some respects. We raised them by talking in our homes with our mothers, with our daughters, with, for some, in some instances for the first time, with our spouses about what our lives and experiences were like. <laughs> and, that's, and that's why I'm a believer. I, because I understand the power of public engagement and discourse. Mm. And that's why I think this conversation can happen. Mm. Uh, and I believe that if we do it, our very wise president will follow. <laughs> <laughs> You're listening to Anita Hill discussing her new book, Reimagining Equality, Stories of Gender, Race, and Finding Home. Now let's take some questions from the audience. Please come forward, as Pat uh, illuminated, and line up at the microphone to the right here. Um, and I've been instructed to say, please limit yourself to one succinct, well-phrased question. <laughs> it's Cambridge, I think that's possible. Um, to allow as many people as possible to think. If you could stand on this side, make this line of questions here, that would be terrific. Remember, you're, you're supposed to have your best side. Your best side to, to the... Uh, and also behind you, yes. <laughs> uh, Professor Hill, um, I, uh, I'm from Michigan, and um, in the city of Detroit, um, there's great poverty and great privilege. Um, Bloomfield Hills, Michigan, great privilege. Public schools have vast resources in that same geographic area, great mm -hmm. poverty. So the question is, with people that, that would like to see change, how do you make that structural change? Because property values are tied in with educational quality. So even if people say, let's redistribute money at a statewide level, which would be more fair than just distributing it at a local level, mm -hmm. how do you do that when people won't want their house values to decrease? So I'm just wondering if you can say a little bit about that, because I think there's a lot of people that would like to see change, but then their own interests somehow are affected and they hesitate. Well, I think people have to understand that their in own interests are already being impacted. Um, that we, you know, when we don't raise an education, re educated population throughout, that we are all going to be suffering. And so, again, it's that connection that people have to make uh, with the lives of others uh, who may not have the privileges that they have. But I think we've got to retrain our thought. Um, and, and, and many of those people in those very nice communities are suffering now. And so we have to ask them, do we want to, do, are they willing to go back to put more money into a system that has put them at risk? And so with that, what I do ask for in the Home Summit is that I don't look at just how do we regulate banks. Uh, I look at how do we establish transportation systems? How do we make decisions about how roads are going to be paved? How do we make decisions about where jobs are going to be located? And so I'm really trying to look at this conversation as a holistic conversation so that we can really start to, to disrupt really our thinking, that kind of thinking about, well, this doesn't matter to me, and really make some structural and long-lasting changes. Thank you. Hi, Anita. Nice to see you again. Thank you. I'm Reverend Ellen Frith. I'm an interfaith minister, and I'm also a disability commissioner. Um, I want to thank you for the succinct way you're putting in how we need to uh, really heal our communities together, and we can't leave anyone out of that process either. And wanted to add one more element in your oh, discussion. You and that is persons with disabilities, children with disabilities, who don't have access to the same opportunities, especially coming from communities where the resources have not been really um, brought in. And I wondered if you could comment a little bit on that and how um, we can bring this into a full circle uh, to really bring in um, uh, the municipalities to really see this as a serious issue, especially with young women of color who then have this, this added, you know, kind of hurdle to deal with. Okay. 
Well, thank you for your question. You know, we have, uh, I have often talked about what happened with the laws protecting against disability discrimination. And in some ways, uh, I, I think it, in, in many ways, it was a laudable effort to try to make sure that uh, access, uh, regardless of ability, was granted to everyone. But what we did in some ways was to simply look at structures, physical structures. And in doing that, we sort of made the changes of putting in a ramp or an elevator, and then we walked away. Uh, we didn't really think about all the different ways that people with disabilities are excluded. And some of those have to do with our own mindset about how we think of the capabilities of individuals and how we judge individuals who might have a physical incapacity. And that has never taken place. I think that's where the discussion has to be begin, with our thinking about what the value of individuals are, uh, wherever they are. And I talk primarily about race and gender because that is my experience. But I have a lot to learn about things that we need to change in terms of how we value people who may not have physical access to all the opportunities that the country has to offer. And so that, I agree, is not something that I talk about so much in the book, but I do think many of the principles still apply. Uh, and, and, and I would say, though, that we've done an adequate job of dealing with physical structures, but we have not even begun to deal with some of the psychological barriers that we impose on people with disabilities. Good evening. Um, I'm having a few thoughts running around in my head, and you really oh, good. made me, <laughs> you've actually made me think of something. I guess I'm saying some of this in the spirit of the 99%, but. The work that I've done is about creating awareness about the dangers of herbicides and pesticides, because mm -hmm. I actually got pesticide poisoning from neighbors' use of pesticides. Mm -hmm. And it makes me think of the greening of the home. The why does my property, the person who will maybe use the pesticide, has to make the huge McMansion, has to use lots and lots of resources. Why is it seeming like in America that there's a certain group of folk, and maybe they're not thinking of this, but it sort of comes out that way, that their need to have more and better and bigger and perfect can end up being, as their home, can be more important than somebody living next door, somebody living in another community. Mm -hmm. Just sort of this sort of inequality sense and the, the, the notion of home, and yet how it sort of becomes skewed in terms of some of these issues how we're destroying our larger home, mm -hmm. the earth, mm -hmm. by some of the practices that we're doing as Americans. And when you go to visit other countries, they look at us when I talk to them about these issues, like, are you kidding that you people have these gated communities with the perfect lawns and lots of, you know what I mean? So that notion of home, I'm wondering if you thought about that at all and what you think about it, if I raise it for the first time for you. Well, I, I believe that a generation of, of uh, people have a new understanding about not only the earth, but also about the connection with, that we have with each other. That's what I'm hoping we can get to, because we can change the trend. We've already changed in many ways how we think about the earth. I mean, imagine, you know, 10 years ago, I didn't recycle, uh, and now it's, it's the norm. So we can do that. I mean, people talk about, well, we can't really change people in that short period of time. 10 years ago, um, if I had sat here uh, 15 years ago, I don't know about the church, but in most public settings, people would have been smoking cigarettes. And we have changed that. So we can change our thinking. I do talk about the, the role of this whole gated community. And basically what I, at, at gated communities, larger houses, uh, more exclusive, if you will, neighborhoods. Um, and really these sort of individual homes that become forts. So whatever I do in my home is, is my business and doesn't impact anybody else. And I think that's what you're talking about. 
Um, I really believe that it's just not sustainable. We believe that we can just move away from all of these old issues and inequalities and that they don't have an impact on us. But if anything proves that what we do uh, impacts everyone, the ecology, e e e uh, the, the ecology does that. This whole greening of America brings that to our attention. And I guess if you would, I'm hoping that we can have something like that when we think about uh, financing and home owning and even rental properties. If we can think about the connection between uh, a child living, currently living in a poor section of town, their ability to find a home and be at home in America, and the ability of an individual who has been living in a gated community, that those two things are related. If we can do that, um, then I think we will have made some progress. It may take a generation for it to happen, but we got to begin the work now. I also might add that the community garden or the home garden or the victory garden as they had back in the Depression is just a lovely way to bring that notion of home and ownership, uh, not ownership, but love of the earth. Well, one of people. the things that I propose is a home yeah. summit. And in that summit, in, in the best of worlds, uh, there would be people from all communities who would have an opportunity to contribute. And, and so well, that is idealistic. I understand that. So be it. Uh, but I think that's the way we can start to understand how and why it's important for all of us. Hi. Hello. Um, my question is, um, or, or an observation I was making is, if we grant privileges on the basis of something as superficial as um, skin color, what we all have to lose is that we are promoting a culture of mediocrity and we are not advancing people based on their skills and what they have to contribute. We are using something superficial to judge people. And I see that in the mortgage crisis too. I thought of my own situation when you were, when you were talking. Um, I'm a homeowner. I went to apply for a loan. I had a subprime mortgage first, 8.9%. Um, I went to apply for a, comp a competing mortgage, and the officer who wanted to help me said, if you want to get this loan, you need to check off this box, and it was ethnicity. And the box he pointed at was Caucasian. And he didn't say that. He just said, you, if you want to get this loan, you need to check off this box. And I had too much pride to check off that box. I checked off African American, and of course I didn't get the loan. So, I mean, I mm -hmm. totally related to what you were saying, and I was able to refinance later on and get a much better rate, but, but I just wanted to well, make that Thank you. Thank and, you. And I, I want to ask you something. What do you have to say to people who point to the uh, individual successes, such as Obama or yourself, and say that racism no longer exists and we have arrived? Oh, well. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Well, uh, to answer that question, I would, st I would really direct them to uh, the, uh, this is chapter seven of my book, Reimagining Equality. Uh, and to, to but what in, that, in that chapter, one of the things that I do is that I, I look at the pleadings in these cases in Illinois and in Maryland and um, in uh, 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 Memphis, and I, I see really what, the legacy of racism and gender bias in lending practices has resulted in. That in 2005, 2006, you had uh, loan officers, according to the complaints, you had loan officers uh, saying that uh, they would go out granny hunting uh, on days looking for women, uh, older women, um, to sell uh, bad loans to, basically, or to take advantage of financially. You had uh, loan lending officers referring to certain loans as ghetto loans and saying that certain people who lived in certain neighborhoods, typically communities of color, didn't deserve any better. And so what it says to me is that the overt signs of racism may not exist for most of us to see, but look behind the curtain just a little bit and you find that they exist there and that they are really 
and, and in this case, I believe had the capacity to bring down a whole financial system. Thank you. Uh, Professor Hill, uh, first, uh, my, I applaud you for being courageous uh, today and in the past uh, and for standing up because it's so difficult to do that some days. Uh, I'm an Italian American, so that my grandparents came here around 1905 uh, and they came with an idea of seeking something better mm -hmm. uh, and, and made things uh, better. My, my uncle was the last chief of police in this uh, great city of Cambridge. Now they have commissioners. But my question is, and I have a concern, um, in this world that we're in, there are so many students that are saddled with loans of over 100, 180, 200 thousand dollars. And uh, they are basically, uh, uh, what, um, working for the man? Mm -hmm. uh, and they answer to Sally Mae, Freddie Mac, and the rest. Mm -hmm. And my hope, as this president, and I voted for him, became president, that there'd be some magic, some sort of fund that would be created to save the students so that the students wouldn't be paying these loans. They can't file bankruptcy. Uh, because uh, th there, it's almost impossible to, to get away from a federally funded student loan. There's nothing that they could do, and if there was some way that someone came up with some idea to free them of this, these shackles, there'd be such an infusion of wealth and spending. Uh, that's my comment, and your thoughts. I'm sure you've thought about it, and thank you again. Well, the cost of education has, as you say, it, it's, it's skyrocketed, and, and a lot of times students are, you know, they are saddled with debt. Um, there are a few programs, there are a few government programs that allow students to get out from under those debts or from which they can get grants, but, you know, those have really been diminishing over the last few decades, and it is a tragedy. I went to school in uh, an era where we still had Pell Grants, and so uh, because I qualified, Financially, uh, my parents uh, couldn't afford to send me to school. I could get a grant. Those are gone. And we, that has to really be a part of our reinvestment in education. Um, again, you know, we've got to have a, a conversation, though, that includes uh, those kinds of realities of people's lives. That's not this book, but maybe it's the next one. <laughs> we can get there. <laughs> Oh, yeah. I, am, I am one of the grandchildren of the Great Migration, so oh. let's talk about home. Uh, my, because I do have this amazing inheritance, I always closely identify it with the Van Hans Ferries, the moon and the sun. Uh, and so while we inherited this, uh, this instinct to battle racial issues, we also inherited a heap of gender junk. <laughs> so <laughs> how do you propose we uh, go to battle at home? with this idea that whatever works for straight, able-bodied black men works for all of us. Mm -hmm. um, because I'm tired of being fodder for other people's <coughs> movements. I'm tired of my point of view not being heard as a black woman. Um, how do you propose we continue to combat that? You know, part of what we have uh, got to think about is who is our representation? Who represents us in the nation that is making these policies? I mean, let's just take one example. Um, we have lived forever with persistent wage gaps for women. Um, it was, I guess, before the recession, 80 cents on the dollar, or close to 80 cents on the dollar women made versus the, the dollar that men made. Now the gap is narrowed, I understand, only because men are making less, not because women are making more. But I don't believe there has ever been an individual who in, um, in the uh, office of the Department of Labor who has actually sat down and said, every day I'm going to get up and I'm going to think about this problem of the persistent wage gap between women and men. And I'm going to think about it and I'm going to work on it until something is done. And I'm going to try different policies and I'm going to you know, promote legislation that will help to do that. We haven't had it. So part of that is representation and who represents us and whether or not they think these concerns are a priority. We 
can change that. It does, it's not going to happen overnight. I mean, and some of you are thinking, oh, well, that's impossible. The politics are such today. But, you know, how many of you would have predicted that Barack Obama could be president? So I think uh, uh, it, and the question that you're raising, I do touch on in reimagining equality when I talk about how we do not value work coming out of the home. And typically that is the kind of work that women do. Uh, or that it's done by women, not all women, but it's done by women, like childcare, like school teaching, even something like uh, those that uh, I raise it in the chapter where I talk about Anjanette Buffer, who is a hairdresser. We have got to understand and begin to see how we undervalue women. So that's the psychological change that we have to address, but there are policy changes that need to be made as well. And we have to put the right people in place to readdress those policy changes so that we can change some of the structures in our workplace. There's some legislation, some equal pay uh, legislation that is being proposed now that would help us begin to do that. And um, I, I won't embarrass you by asking you to raise your hand if you have called your congressperson to say, pass the Equal Pay Act. But if you haven't, please do. That will be a great start. Hi, Professor Hill. It's a great honor to be here and be able to hear what you have to say and Thank you. to learn about your new book. And I'm sorry, but I have to <laughs> go back to history. I just think it's so interesting that you're here speaking to us today when Clarence Thomas is embroiled in a big controversy with the money that his wife has received from the corporation and mm -hmm. the conflict of interest. Mm -hmm. And I wondered what you thought about that. <laughs> and I wondered what you thought about when she, I also was so curious, what was your reaction when she came out and demanded that you apologize? <laughs> well, I couldn't, I can't help asking it. <laughs> I, I, will, I will just tell you, the results speak for itself. I didn't apologize. But I, I'm gonna ask, uh, I, will, I will go about your question in a roundabout way. Um, you said you were going to go to history, and I'll go to a little bit to history, too. When I testified in 1991, it was really because I cared about the integrity of the court. That was what mattered to me, the integrity of the individuals who are appointed to lifetime positions on the court. That is what mattered then. That is what matters now, and that hasn't changed, and I will leave the rest for you to figure out You think out he'll be answer. tossed out? I have, I, don't, I know. don't know, I can't speculate about that. But again, it really, all of these questions, any of the questions that go to the integrity of the justices on the court are concerns that we all should have. Absolutely. Thank, Thank you. you. So I'm gonna close on, on uh, one more question on your book and, uh, and then I hope we'll have a book signing and many of you will uh, purchase this terrific book. I. I I was really struck by the separation of the American dream from, as you recently said here, this idea of purchasing a home and moving up and moving up, to this notion of home and belonging and sort of an investment in what I partially translated into a public space, meaning that our personal spaces and our families are also part of communities and part of mm -hmm. the nation. And I wondered what you thought of the Occupy Wall Street um, idea. <laughs> and. Uh, and, 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 and the idea of sort of wanting to have kitchens and community spaces on Wall Street, it wasn't just a protest, it's like a, it's like a, uh, a neighborhood uh, yeah, they're taking, being taking set over up. Uh, exactly. what the, how things are done, how things look. You know what, the part of it that really resonates with me is that the fact that just a handful of people are really taking a stand. And they're raising their voices. And they're inspiring all of us to think differently. I mean, that's to me what is so important about what is going on in cities all over the country. Um, now, there, with all of that, there, is, there are so many efforts. I know there's a journalism class here tonight. Part of what I'm not hearing so much about is the media getting engaged with us. And that is another thing that has to happen. Um, I think there are some recipes for their success. 
it starts with their public, and their, their engagement, their private engagement, private risk taking. But again, there has to be some momentum that is built up, and the media can help to do that. Um, that's really what I'm hoping will happen when we talk about home. I just can't see that we are going to be satisfied with going back to where we were, which is the situation in the early 2000s, the first of the, the uh, new century, where we were just putting so much at risk in terms of the housing market. We have come to a point of crisis, and for me it's a wake-up call. And if it requires us to go and camp out in front of Wells Fargo Bank or to camp out um, in front of some other financial institution, so be it. But I don't think that it does. I think what I, my idea is that we come together, all of us who have an interest in resolving this crisis, and that's everybody in this room, we come together and really start grappling with the issues of how we're going to move forward. And so, you know, I, I hope you'll read the book with that in mind. I'm hoping that when you read the book, that one, you'll think differently about the importance of home, and that two, whether you buy the whole idea of a home summit, that you do something different in the way that you act. Uh, I had a, a woman who said, I read the book, and what I did was I went and I volunteered in shelters to help people who were homeless. That may be what you do. But what I would say to you is use your voice, use your talents, use your skills to do something because a future generation really is depending on you. Thank you. You've been listening to a program of Cambridge Forum recorded in October 2011, co-sponsored by the First Parish in Cambridge, the Lowell Institute, and the Friends of the Cambridge Forum. For a CD of this forum entitled Reimagining Equality, featuring Anita Hill, or for additional information about our ongoing radio series and our forum network webcast, visit us. Thank you.